right? There's no shortcut home. Like now you're here, and the only way to really get through the return is to go through the tough stuff. And it, it obviously is a metaphor, I think, for a lot of things in life. Like you have to do the work and go through the conversation. This idea that we, we're embarrassed and we don't want to have these very rough conversations, it cannot work. They, they pop up in other ways. And I think we're experiencing that now. These, these cultural, very polarized debates around white privilege and race and who deserves what and affirmative action. All of these things are. People are so angry, and they just need to really be walked through and discussed. So I'd say, number one, you have to have blunt conversations. And number two, you have to hear people's personal experiences. We, again, have perceptions about who people are. Oh, those people from Chicago. You know, and then you meet some people from Chicago, and you're like, well, shoot, they're just like regular people from Chicago. I mean, that's, you know, it, it's funny. As a New Yorker, that sounds so idiotic to me, right? But I'm sure in New York, people are like, well, you know, that's people from Maine. <laughs> to hearing each other. I think that's a really good start, and I, I think um, I'm very proud of people that I've seen certainly on this campus and other campuses who've decided that they're going to uh, not keep their mouth shut, even if they're in a minority of minority on the campus, that they're going to speak what is their truth. I think that's a very scary thing to do. I think it can be very isolating, and I think it's an amazing thing that social media has given a lot of people this feeling that they're not alone. But they have a voice, so their experience is their experience, and it's very valid. So I, I think that's a really good start. Yeah, oh. social media is a good outcome. One of the things I think that should happen is that white students need to care about race as much as black students do. We have lots of conversations about, among African American students about racism, racism on campus, which I'm sure every campus, every student who has those kind of conversations, where they're back to the color. And when it's only coming from African-American students, many people perceive it as white. But when white students decide that this is important to them too, and if you're the leaders of the future, you have to decide that it's important to you too, then the Student Government Association is one of the groups that raises some of these questions. Where are the minority faculty? Why do we have so few women in the science faculty? Things like that. So it doesn't come off as the industry school is pushing but because this is a national issue that everybody is pushing. Have real friends sometimes too. You don't have social media. You can't just stop right there and say, "Hey, you know, a whole bunch of black people." So, everybody else is uh, try to do your best to keep your being in unit and reach out to people and be informed. And that's going to become harder to do as we get into the next seven, eight years. Separated in their own little enclaves, and then still try to have a final decision on, on, on relationships. So that's an issue that, 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 that the whole society has to work on. And as Director of African American Studies, I would be remiss if I do not advise you to take ethnic studies classes. I think classroom environments are really safe spaces to begin having some of those blunt conversations that Soledad is advising us to have. And so I encourage students of all backgrounds to take ethnic studies courses, find out about cultures other than their own. You don't have a body without a head. So the administration, the management, uh, those who have been mentorships, they have to really be in, in some sort of order for that artist to be able to be free to follow. So if you're looking for artists to start this movement without the help of good, the sensibility of your minds to guide them, then you'll be spinning and waiting for a long time. Artists are being led by lawyers and managers to know when you die in a certain way. Where they come from, or, where they are, or who they're talking to. And they're there for one reason to see if they can actually further a career by any means necessary. But um, it's not going to be a thing. It's, it's going to start from a whole bunch of different people contributing in the mindset that protects and also projects culture so it can be beneficial all the way around. That's the way it's always worked around the world. And, uh, and culture has to be supported by education systems too as being powerful so you don't let the corporations run away with it. Because at the end of the day, culture is going to influence a hell of a lot of people. But if you have a business person influence as opposed to maybe somebody who's academic, you're going to have so many side effects that you're looking at right now. So, folks, 
expect artists to start any movement, but to reflect what's going on. But just like Jamie Brown and all those guys in the 60s, they didn't start their movement. The movement was there, and they forced artists to come right now. So society of thinkers can't be overlooked. Academia can't be overlooked. Being smart or smarter can't be looked down or downplayed in society. One of the things that you're more expert on this than I am, but what management requires of hip hop artists in terms of lyrics pushes them, I think, to the lowest common denominator as opposed to the upper common denominator. Uh, one of my nephews is a comedian and quasi rapper. I say quasi, and often I say, back that he's a comedian, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> The person above us do a god on dollars. Um, but in any case, I mean, he had a comedy act that I thought was pretty clean, and the guy who was managing him told him, you know, you've got to do the nasty stuff. You've got to put the sex stuff in there. And I went to one of his comedy sets that was not one clean comedian. Not a single person who did not get on that stage and have something that was gross regarding sex. I mean, at some level, I feel sorry for the young people who hear that, because to me, sex is supposed to be a beautiful human experience. It shouldn't be reduced to body parts and jokes. I mean, it's personal. Um, but when the head of the comedy club says, we need you to get down and dirty, what are the comedians going to do? Yeah, that's, 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 that's when it's time to drag out the head of the comedy club. The community does it. Look, if the Community doesn't protect and support the arts. You can't expect the arts to protect or support the community. So the community has to be the role of somebody who says, look, you can't just be like throwing these, these artists out there and making these standards so low that, I mean, it metastasizes to a point where in the United States of America, you have to wait culture and say, what does it do for the people that came out of it? And you're coming up with diminishing returns, not just culturally, but business-wise, which is not a good business. So a lot of the people who've been puppeteering the strings on culture, you have to identify them because they're anonymous and they're not identifiable, so therefore it's going to go on until you actually put a spotlight on them. Well, I was disinvited from attending four shows. By who? My nephew, after I, uh, <laughs> no, after I took on the head of the club, who was an African-American, said, what is wrong with you? It's got to be people who put around the street. The first time I met him, I actually chided him on the lack of women comedians, feeling that women might be a little cleaner. Unfortunately, oh. unfortunately, when I went to the show, the woman was the dirtiest of them all. She got on the floor and attempted to simulate the sexual act. At which point, I literally got up and said, who is the head of this thing? And uh, I understand, I'm Julia, you don't have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that it's positioned as a this versus this. But it really shouldn't be, right? At the end of the day, it's basic. What you're expecting is policing should be helping the community, the people who live there should look to the police to serve them. So I think it's about really getting back to the roots of, of what policing is supposed to do. And I think a lot of people have a lot of sort of suggestions. Community policing is one. I think what they've done legally in New York City around stop and frisk is another good step, right? And if you crunch the data and you say, this is biased and it cannot stand it, and now this has to change, and everybody has to be on board trying to figure out how to make that change. So sometimes the most important thing is to look at the numbers and say, clearly, this is not serving the people who live here, this is criminalizing the people who live here. And now what are we going to do as a community to fix it? I think that's the, the, the main thing. The African-American law enforcement officers, I think, play a very critical role in some of this. I mean, they see both sides of the story. There are brothers, our fathers, our nephews. And so they see on one hand what's going on, on the other hand, they are police officers, they're law enforcement. One of the things I think the president has done that's positive of all these commissions come out with things that people already know, is set up this um, policing commission. The reason I think it's positive is that it's led by the police chief of Philadelphia, 
who is an African American man, who's a former police chief in Washington, D.C., and I believe he was a big city number two police chief before he came to Washington and then went to Philadelphia. So I do think the African American um, law enforcement officers, then the Latino law enforcement officers, then the Asian law enforcement officers, because law enforcement has somewhat diversified. But the thin blue line where people don't tell each other is culturally embedded in police departments and whether you're African American or Caucasian or Latino or Asian, if you've been inculcated into the police culture, you're often conflicted about saying something to your white partner or reporting to your white partner. 